good Wednesday morning, and today we'll be talking with John about the role that books play in a Christian life. Additionally, two plugs. If you have any questions for John that you want to answer, you can go to www.johnpatrick.ca forward slash ask. So again, the role that books play in a Christian life. I grew up in a home that was striking if one could have looked down from above in a, a row of 400 working class houses as was probably as I realized later one of perhaps only two or three houses that had any significant number of books um, so I grew up with books around me and fortunately some of the friends of my mother realized I was an odd little guy and I really love books and so they fed me good books over over the years and of course right from the beginning children are absolutely uh, primed for stories they'll even turn the television off for mum or dad to read to them uh, that's hardwired in us we have a need for narrative and we need it to get it from our parents first of all uh, and then you move on I mean I loved reading the Narnia stories to all my children I'm afraid I preempted that from my wife I said I want to read the Narnia stories because you'll tell them what it means I want to see them learn what it means for themselves uh, which I did so when you start looking around and reading you, you realize children's books starting at that level are dangerous there are lots of books out there that are basically pagan and you need to be able to recognize that the stories can be good but you have to be able to show them what's going on a little bit uh, I remember some years ago I, I was in Nigeria and one of the things I was asked to do which was lovely for me was actually to talk to a bunch of Anglican bishops who wanted to talk to me uh, wonderful guys they were not like the modern evangelical uh, evangelist who gets himself a white Rolls Royce and says God wanted me to have it uh, these guys were much smarter than that they, they were living simple lives and they were concerned about their uh, their charges their, their churches what do we do um, and so I asked them I said what kind of stories do the children in Nigeria know best? Now I knew what the answer was but I wanted them to say it and it didn't take very long. And the dominant stories in Africa, in Central Africa, uh, all the way across, are animal stories. Not surprising you have no written language because if you live in the tropics and you write anything down on paper the ants will have eaten the paper before very long that's one of the great advantages of modern technology the ants don't eat it um, and they are basically interesting stories where a big animal is beaten by a little animal by trickery so the rabbit uh, in Aesop's fables which come although it's called Aesop the, the stories of that sort come you find them in Africa where a, a spider or a rabbit beats a big animal. In The spider is called a Nancy. You will find him in Jamaica as well as in Africa. So you see, their main stories make trickery a good thing. The trickster wins. So in Nigeria, uh, trickery is okay and even in Jamaica you find the same thing a con man is oh that was clever and they get away with it it ought not to be that way but that's the way it is so um, the story we inhabit matters now you don't find trickery in the stories of the Bible not to be adulated and followed so the question is how do you get the stories the children's stories changed you see most of our favorite children's stories have a Judeo-Christian background but now since multiculturalism and all its lies have dominated you have multicultural stories which are effectively a lie because you can't have a multicultural culture 
It's a contradiction in terms. Uh, so we need to think about this quite a lot. Uh, you've got to look at the stories. Now, uh, the person who's written about it best, I think, is uh, Michael O'Brien, who's actually written a little book about uh, children's stories, uh, the title which I've forgotten at the moment. But uh, as a, a pure aside, if you want some really great novels with deeply Christian subtext, start with Michael O'Brien uh, for a modern story. I, I would say Island of the World. I'm looking at it up on the shelf. I mean, it's this thick. Um, is a page turner, deeply, deeply Christian, can bring you to tears uh, and change your life. So start with children's stories, start thinking about them. They must know the stories of the Bible. Then when you move on from that, there are plenty of people out there who are writing well. You've got to do some homework. Uh, you also make them better writers if you do. I mean, obviously, uh, the Narnia stories come to mind immediately. Uh, Little House on the Prairie, uh, the series which children love as well, is deeply Christian in many respects. Uh, then you have people like Rosemary Sutcliffe and many others. Once you start looking and you'll find people writing about children's stories who actually care, um, you'll be on your way. Now, so I grew up with good stories, the Bible stories first and then People fed me good children's stories, which were innocent, uh, but got to me. Interestingly enough, one of the stories that first got me is not a nice story in many ways. Uh, uh, I mean, The Count of Monte Cristo is a two-volume story, which I must have read about age 11 or something like that. And it's about very sophisticated revenge. Uh, but. For some reason, I really enjoyed the story of this man who was wrongly imprisoned and managed to amazingly escape, discover a fortune, and then come back into the society and find the people who had tried to destroy him, and he destroyed them. Um, we want moral consequence, don't we? We have a deep need for that. So... Then I became uh, more obsessed with science, so uh, I wasn't reading as much in terms of literature as I perhaps should have done. Uh, and the science was not taught as I, I now teach it. I, I, I teach a course uh, on the history of science, and I largely want it to be narrative. Uh, because I know that the vast majority of kids in university at the moment, if you wrote an equation on the blackboard, you would, on the board or on the, put it on the screen, you would lose them immediately. Those that could do equations would be fine, but they're a very small group. So the problem was, how do I get these young people to think about science by getting them to read differently and... Uh, the way through that was to start thinking, looking at biography. Biographies are... I read a lot of biographies when I was a child. The Jungle Doctor series are, are biographical, but I read many very real-life missionary biographies. Uh, and that's good, because in until relatively recently, when you went off as a missionary, well, many of them packed their things in their coffin. They were never going to come back if they went to, say, North America or Africa. Uh, and the, the death rate for missionaries in Africa was huge. Uh, but I read about this courage, and I didn't think about the question of how powerful the gospel must be to make people do that. I just loved the, the stories. But no one had ever taught me the history of science that way. Um, it needs to be done that way. I haven't done it, but maybe uh, somebody who's more um, reliable than I am will get round to doing it. But for instance, um, with the young people today, uh, uh, I often ask them, look at the thing, you, uh, your hand is going to your pocket already for your phone. Let me tell you a story. Uh, about the man without whom you wouldn't have that much treasured possession. 
And I tell the story very briefly, a 90-second biography. Born in London to a very poor family, father a blacksmith, no education to speak of except in the church where he was several times a week. Working by the time he was 11 or 12 as an apprentice bookbinder. Fortunately for him, his boss was a good man and realised this was a smart boy and said, you can read those books, you know, in your breaks. So he started reading science and was fascinated. Went to the free public lectures, particularly at the Royal Institute, where they had demonstrations. There's still a Christmas lecture for children every year in the Royal Institute with his name attached to it. Um, took good notes. By the time he was 15 or so, he knew he didn't want to spend his life binding books. So, uh, he wanted to be, in our terms, the lab tech who set up the, the experiments to go with the lectures at the Royal Institute. So he bound his treasured notes beautifully, which he could do, and sent them to the president of the Royal Institute, who fortunately him, for him was a good Christian man, uh, who didn't throw these things in the garbage, say, I've no time for that. Obviously the binding was impressive. Uh, but he read them, and he was impressed by the quality of the note-taking, and even more impressed with the desires and ideas that the young man had about the next experiment. Well, he got the job with a few hiccups. And in a few years, he had met all the major scientists who were going through Europe. Uh, and they knew there was this very smart young man in London who'd never been to high school, let alone university. Eventually he actually became president of the Royal Institute and he turned down the Royal Society, which is the greatest honour in science in England, on the grounds that he was too busy several times. And he was known to stop the committee meetings at the Royal Institute in order for him to get to his prayer meeting. You do know his name, but you don't know it in this context. It's very rare that I get anyone who can tell me his. A few know. His name is Michael Faraday. When Michael Faraday proposed the idea of electrical fields, everybody laughed. Fields were a great joke, but electromagnetics and fields are essential to your smartphone. Now, if that story began the unit on electricity in high school, I think it might get under the skin of some boys who are dropping out. They might actually feel a bit guilty. If he, with no education at all, could do that, maybe I could do a bit more. He can turn you around. So, biography should be, there should be a shelf for biography. There should be a shelf for children's stories. There should also be a shelf for poetry. Now, this is pushing the envelope because people don't read poetry very much. But... Um, one that I think almost anyone could start reading and it might lead them further in would be uh, Other Men's Flowers by Lord Wavell. Now Wavell was a British general in the Second World War. He was the one who actually set things up so that Montgomery could succeed in North Africa because he was strong enough to hold Churchill back saying, we can't push forward yet, we don't have the resources, it would just be a massacre, we've got to build. In the end, Churchill threw him out, but he'd got all the logistics in place, and Montgomery was able to do what he did, but only because of Wavell. Now, Wavell's uh, book, Other Men's Flowers, poetry was what he did to relax his mind. And the point about that book is about this thick, is that he knew every one of those poems by heart. To get into that book, he had to be able to recite the whole poem. Uh, which for young people is quite astonishing. They have memories, but they've never thought of using them in that way. Would that they did. They'd, they'd, they'd love it so much later on. So when I came across that book, uh, I loved it because I, I could. it's arranged in different sections on arts and war and what, what have you. Um, and it got to me. Uh, my mother loved poetry, and we, we did learn poetry when when I was uh, young, uh, young in school, and she would always learn them with me. Uh, so it, it's in the family, I guess. Uh, we all like language in that way. But poetry can feed your soul. I mean, everybody 
uh, used to know the Lord's Prayer. Uh, a lot of people don't know. Uh, when it came to dying, when I was a young doctor, the last thing that people would want would be the Lord would be uh, the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want um, we don't have those riches available to us now lines of poetry come back to me all over the t all over the place and I have to go and look where did that come from I, I know it's poetry and uh, I can it's easy to find nowadays you know my my favorite description of what it means to be a doctor is just a few lines by W. H. Auden, but it is so countercultural and yet so obviously true that that it's a wonderful introduction. And I haven't said a word. Uh, this I'm just quoting Wavell. No, not Wavell. Auden. He goes like this: "Give me a doctor partridge plump, short in the leg and broad in the rump, an endomorph." with gentle hands, who will not make absurd demands that I abandon all my vices, nor pull long faces in a crisis, but with a twinkle in his eye will tell me that I have to die. That's the kind of doctor you want when you're coming to the end of your life. Not somebody who's going to stuff another line in or another tube in, but somebody who's going to take them out and say, your time has come, and walk with you to the gates of death, so to speak. Uh, the famous picture before we had much in the way of treatment of the family doctor praying at the bedside of a child. Uh, yeah. I mean, it wasn't until, oh, the mid-1850s or thereabouts uh, that it was actually a good idea to go to the doctor if you were concerned of living. It wasn't profitable to go to the doctor in terms of your life expectancy until the 1850s. So why did you go? You went because you needed to understand what was happening to you, to know what the prognosis was, uh, to have your mind not necessarily set at rest, but at least have something to work out what you've got to do in the next little while. Those few lines of poetry, they help. Uh, all children can be taught a poem like Blake's Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Light. What dread hand or what dread eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? You know, children will love it. Um, so, start some poetry uh, and let us help too. In this area, for instance, uh, people are so busy. Uh, I love Fenelon, who is a Catholic writer. He was a bishop at about the time of the Louis. Um, he never became Pope. He should have been. He would have been the best they had, but a more um, aggressive man won, and he went back to his bishopric. But he wrote these beautiful letters. People would write to him with their problems, and then he would set out in a couple of pages what he thought about their problem and how to go about it. One a little bit of it comes into my mind at this point. He, somebody wrote to him about the problem of... Uh, talent and how you use it and how fragile it was and he said something like this he said there is no gift that God gives us that he doesn't usually have to take away not to take it away permanently but simply to deprive it of our sense of ownership which we don't have uh, that's wrong he will give it back then without that awful sense of ownership. So that, that, that's poetry. And you know, once you start, you'll go on doing it. I mean, the, the poetry book that I probably go back to most often is a, The Greatest Poet of the First World War, uh, Wilfred Owen. My subject is war and the pity of war. You know, lines, he's got such a lovely flow of language that... Uh, uh, lines come back, move him, move him into the sun. Uh, red lips are not so red as the stones that are kissed by the blood of the English dead. You know, these are just perfect lines. Um, so poetry ought to be on the shelf. Uh, the great novels, that's easy enough to find. And I, I've tried to introduce you to Michael O'Brien, who I think is the most, one of the most important modern novelists that I've discovered. There are many that I haven't, of course, because that's not my area of expertise. Um, now, what about Christian writing? We all 
need to have people that we trust in this area and who feed our souls and that's just going to be very personal uh, probably related to who you've heard preach that sort of thing um, Martin Lloyd-Jones had a huge effect on me because I, I went to his church when I got to university it's the first Sunday in London somebody took me to hear Martin Lloyd-Jones great gift uh, he used to preach three roughly hour long sermons a week one on Friday evening which was a Bible reading and in five years I think he got through one chapter of Romans and he was never boring not boring at all uh, then on Sunday morning he would preach uh, for basically for Christians uh, I that's where I came across the beginnings of my own understanding of this the Sermon on the Mount, the two volumes of sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, which are brilliant. And then in the evening, he, he wanted to get to unbelievers, bring your friends. And I mean, there would be 1,500 people in the church and half of them would be students. And I can still remember some of those sermons. I can't say that at many lectures. But uh, Lloyd-Jones, yeah, I can almost hear his voice. Um, he preached on a, an earthquake in Agadir uh, the week after that, that occurred. 3,000 people were killed in a moment. And he had the courage on Sunday to take the text, Think ye that they on whom the tower in Siloam fell were sinners more than the rest of you? I tell you, no. But if you do not repent, you will likewise perish. And he talked about the only justification for the disasters and the suffering of life must be that there is a bigger context into which to put it. God is, he didn't say this, is the way I put it, uh, a utilitarian. He will do whatever's necessary to wake your soul up. Better is the, 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 the uh, detective in the monastery, it come quietly, it's easier that way. Uh, when God gets on to you, it's better to come quietly. Uh. So, Lloyd-Jones is there. Uh, among modern Christian writers, the people who mattered to me most would be Leslie Newbegin's uh, Foolishness to the Greeks, which helped me to think about science from a Christian point of view. Uh, Tom Wright, N.T. Wright, uh, on how, is the, of the modern theologians, the one that I found most useful to me. Uh, when you've read those, you'll start that one leads to another. The way to find a book to read is to read a book that's good and then note who is quoted. Philosophically, the person who's had the most influence on me would undoubtedly be Alastair MacIntyre and After Virtue. Not an easy book to read, but worth the effort if you've got the mind to do it. It will change you. Uh, I mean, the, the last... I, I suppose it's an example of how... for people to see how how books can get under your skin. McIntyre opens that book with a parable. He says, I want you to imagine a know-nothing government taking charge. Not difficult for us, I add. Uh, we've had a, we have a know-nothing government at the moment, and so do you. Um, and they decide, wrongly of course, that all the problems in the world are due to science and scientists. So they believe in utopian futures, uh, which is not going to happen. And so they kill the scientists, lynch them, blow up the laboratories, burn the libraries. And of course, they don't get a wonderful green new world where everything is beautiful. They get chaos. And they try to reinvent science by finding what they can in the ruins and teaching it by rote, not with understanding. Then says McIntyre, what I'm proposing to you in this book is that is where we are now and this is the late this would be 70s late 1970s I think early 80s that period anyway he was a, and he says but not in relation to science but in relation to morality we have no overarching sense of what morality is just as they had destroyed any overarching sense of science and we will suffer because of that. In fact, he sees no real way forward other than the second coming. He, he himself started as a Marxist and ends as a Roman Catholic. Um, 
still alive, I believe. But at the end of the book, he's got a, a wonderful ending. He says, if you, I'm paraphrasing freely, he says, if you have followed my arguments, you will understand uh, that I am proposing that we have already entered into a second Dark Ages. But we should not be entirely without hope. Last time this happened, good men and women withdrew from shoring up the Roman Imperium into forming communities within which they could keep the civilities and the virtues alive. And they succeeded. That, of course, was the monastic movement. So the only difference is, last time the barbarians were waiting at the gate. This time they have been ruling us for quite some time. And it is our failure to understand that fact that is at the heart of our problem. We are waiting for a doubtless new St. Benedict. Benedict formed the monasteries which preserved the gospel after the fall of the Roman Empire. And we're looking for new options of that sort. We do have people who are so ahistorical uh, that McIntyre's prediction has turned out to be absolutely right. I mean, the Black Lives Matter people are absolutely astonished when you say, well, where are the greatest number of slaves in the world at the moment? Well, it, it, it's in Africa. It's in the Sudan and it's in Mali. Where did most of the slaves from Africa go? Not to North America. They went into Muslim countries. The reason they don't have uh, a black community is that the Muslims routinely castrated all male slaves. We didn't. So you're here because we didn't do that. That's not in any way to justify slavery, but do do some homework. Slavery has been part of every culture we know anything about. And the only one that began to get rid of it was deeply rooted in Judeo-Christian thought. Thank you, Dr. John, for talking this morning. Thank you guys for listening. If you guys are enjoying this, let us know. Feel free to leave a review for the podcast or subscribe on YouTube. And tune in next week for the next talk. Thank you.